Okay, part two of our discussion on home range calculations. Um, what we're going to talk about in this set of slides is the difference between spatial interpolation and density estimates. Um, these are ways of converting vector data, points, to raster surfaces, continuous surfaces. And there's two basic methods for converting points to surfaces. We can calculate, like I said, a continuous surface from discrete point locations. The different methods for doing this are interpolation and density surfaces. So the field's value at any cell in a raster is the estimate of um, a density of discrete objects at that location when we're talking about densities. So let's look at this slide here to compare the difference between density and interpolation. So here's a data set of points, and at each point's location, we have some value that's been measured. It could be rainfall, inches of rainfall, it could be um, wind speeds, it could be deaths. Um, maybe each one of these is a city, and this is the number of deaths over the last week, um, something like that. That was a little dark, sorry. <laughs> I have COVID on the brain, apparently. Okay, so um, a continuous field of, like I said, atmospheric temperature measurements at eight irregularly spaced sample points. They could be weather stations, um, they could be cities. So it could also be, like I said, population in thousands, or um, it could be a death rate or a live birth rate, or something like that. Okay, so if we were to want to create a raster surface where we estimate between these measured locations. That's called interpolation. So we would interpolate what's going on between these points by um, taking into consider consideration their proximity to each other, their nearness to each other, and also the value measured at each point's location. That's interpolating. If in the instance of having these eight locations and maybe population, some weighted measure at each one of these locations, if we wanted to create a consistent raster surface and estimate between them, um, that would be a density estimation. What we'd be doing is um, using kind of a neighborhood or bandwidth um, to to create a density, and I'm gonna show you specifically what that looks like in a second. So here are a bunch of points and a landscape, <laughs> and then two different raster surfaces created from each one. And I'm wondering if you can see the difference. So notice the, the ISO lines here, and the way this pattern is radiating out versus the way this pattern is radiating out. And I'm wondering if you can see the difference and guess which one is an interpolated surface and what which one is a density surface. This raster map, so if you strip the points off, the raster is displayed semi-transparently over a hillshade but this raster is a map of density. It's taking the locations into consideration and mapping a density. Whether it's using a weighted measure at each location or not, um, it's looking at the density, the placement of the points. This one is an interpolation of values at the points. Same data set, but you can see we've got a really low value here. We've got a cluster of something that's being measured with very high values here. So our, our highest values are clustering down here, and we've got lower values up here. Even though we've got a higher density of points, the values being measured at the points are lower. So this is an interpolated surface, and this is a density surface. Okay, so when to interpolate and when to densify. Like I said, um, density measures a quantity of an input point throughout a landscape to produce a continuous surface. Shouldn't be waving that thing around, that's really annoying. Um, the output density values are, um, the, the units are um, entity per some unit squared. Okay, it's, it's almost like a predictive surface. 
Um, visiting every location in a study area to measure height, magnitude, or concentration of a phenomenon is usually difficult or expensive, but you could use a strategically dispersed sample of input point locations and use interpolation to assign an estimated value to all other locations. This is what we do with rainfall, wind speeds, solar radiation. We're obviously not measuring at every single you know, three meter cell on a, on a landscape. We're, we're estimating or interpolating in between them. Okay, so density analysis takes known quantities of some phenomenon and spreads it across the landscape based on the quantity that's measured at each location. Um, why, why would you wanna do this? Density surfaces are good for showing where point or line features are concentrated and then you can also weight it. Um, say you've got a point value for a bunch of cities representing the total number of people in the city, but you wanna learn more about the spread of the population over the region. Since all the people in the town don't live exactly at the population point that's marking the city, by calculating density, you can get a surface showing the predicted distribution of the population throughout the landscape even though you have to obviously take into consideration that it's an estimate because cities do actually have layouts and population densities can fluctuate within you know, the spread of, of housing units. Um, but it's a more realistic look other than just looking at a point value that has some value associated with it. Um, so this idea of a neighborhood um, or what I called a bandwidth this is an important thing to uh, keep in mind because if your, your kind of search radius or neighborhood is very small, you're gonna get a really peaky or spiky density surface. Um, and I'm gonna show you examples of that right now. So um, density estimation is done using something called a kernel. And the tool you're gonna be using is called a kernel density estimation, a KDE. It's a mathematical function that replaces each point's location with a 3D model that I like to think of and other people have described as a pile of sand. And the sand can have different spreads um, and different shapes, but they're constant shapes when you're running the tool. So like I said, instead of a point location that would just be one discrete XY location with a value associated with it, we can interpolate that value under the area of this three-dimensional curve. And that mathematical function is called the kernel. All right, so let's take a look at this here. Here we've got a bunch of points and we're looking down at them from the top. Um, we can create these three-dimensional kernels to take the value associated at each location and um, represent that information like under a PDF, a probability density function, this little three-dimensional pile of sand. Where the piles of sand overlap, um, you're gonna get a bigger kernel. We're gonna sum, using calculus, underneath this three-dimensional shape to pile these piles of sand together. The distance, the spread this way is your bandwidth or your, your search radius, um, yeah, there are other names for it, but let's stick with that for now. If we flip these and look at them from the side, these are the different shapes of the kernels. And this is looking in uh, two dimensions, but it's a three-dimensional shape piled on top of each one of these. Um, uniform, triangle, um, quartic, Gaussian is this light orange thing here. This is the, the kind of default shape for most tools. Um, and it's this spread is called the bandwidth, but it's the area under the curve equals an observation. So um, locations that have a high value, like a city with a huge population versus a city with a low one, you're gonna have a larger or smaller area under this curve. Each point is gonna be replaced by the kernel. And when the kernels are added, the result is a density surface whose smoothness depends on the value of the bandwidth, the distance parameter, the search radius, this distance right here, and that's user defined. Um, it is often set with a default, but that's up to you to decide. Um, so like I said, if you have a skinnier bandwidth, you're gonna get spikier kernels. And if you have large bandwidths, you're gonna get 
flat kernels and you're going to get different looks and I'll show you an example of that. Okay, so um, in ArcGIS Pro, Gaussian is the default um, is the default kernel shape and there isn't a way to change this that I know of. Um, there are other tools for running kernel density um, and maybe a Python script would allow you to, to fix that, but you can um, change the search radius. And if you click on this to read about the search radius, it explains here how it's calculated, the statistics that go into it, um, so that if you're using this for research, you would need to be able to defend this and make sure that you're comparing apples to apples if you're trying to you know, repeat somebody else's research. Okay, um, yeah, again, if you're looking for more information, know that you can Google the HE double hockey sticks out of this stuff and find um, how the black box is working behind the scenes and get the actual uh, formulas for how bandwidth is calculated. Let's look at some examples though. Um, so here's the default. Here we've got a set of points, I ran kernel density, and we got a density surface out of some points using the default search radius. I went in and manually changed the search radius to 100 meters. And you can see here, we just got a little tiny um, density output around each point's location. I changed the search radius to 500 meters. I'm zooming in on this area right here, by the way. So that's really close to what the default was just by accident. Changed it to 750 meters and then again to 1,000 meters. So you can see the smoothing that's happening. We're losing some of the fidelity of the density surface here. Does it mean this one's wrong? No, but I'm just showing you that you get a smoothing um, output if you increase that search radius. You're flattening each one of the kernels and it's taking a larger area into consideration and you get a more of a generalization. So um, the search radius by default does a pretty good job of estimating. Um, but it's up to you to change that. What might the search radius depend on? You know, if you're looking at a coyote, for example, um, the tool doesn't know what your entity is. The tool doesn't know if you're you're looking at, um, uh, you know, alien sightings or actual coyote radio data or, um, you know, GPS readings taken from somebody who's riding a mountain bike through a state park. It doesn't know. It's It's looking at the uh, nearest neighbor proximity doing some spatial statistics calculations and, and optimizing. But it's possible that your creature um, and the way it behaves might impact the search radius. So for our purposes in this lab, stick with the default. Um, if you're using this for your research, you should, you should do some reading and thinking about um, what's, what search radius makes sense for you. Definitely document the type of search radius and the distance that you're using. Uh, units, again, are magnitude per unit area, um, and you can, when you're running kernel density, include a population field to weight these locations. Okay, um, here's another example, search radius of 500 meter, meters, um, a completely different data set, search radius of 2,000 meters. Um, and you can see the values here are, um, are changing. So here we have um, a, like a predicted coyotes per square kilometer, maybe. And here, the same thing. We have a lower uh, density value here. So be aware. The results will most likely be affected by seasonality, environmental conditions, whether they're biotic or abiotic. Um, the type of species, individual characteristics like age, gender, experience, are they um, being affected by uh, brooding or um, pup rearing, uh, competition, prey, um, impact uh, due to uh, human related activities. So a lot of things to consider to make these logical surfaces. Um, I'm going to stop there for now and we'll come back with part three.